great to be here. PIX 2015. Um, thanks for inviting me here. And I wanted to also thank some of my sponsors who've made my work possible for this project. Glazier's Camera, Kodak, Panda Lab, Photo Center Northwest, and especially the Blue Earth Alliance, who has sponsored this project and believed in this vision for my Cuba work from the very early years. And I'm grateful to them and Natalie Phobes for creating the Blue Earth. It's a tough act to follow with Tom. The Duwamish is an important subject and is such an inspiration for local projects that are creating social change. It's been really amazing to be part of the Blue Earth Alliance community of photographers because I've been inspired by each of them just as much as I have the subjects of my own work. And um, I'm here tonight to talk about the importance of having a point of view in photography. Having a point of view is imperative. It's what allows us to see in a deeper, more sensitive way. There's a moment in each of our lives where there's a reckoning. There's often a catalyst for inspiration. There's been a guiding force to drive and inspire me to create the work that I do, and that is the fundamental belief that photography has the power to be a tool for social change. Changing consciousness lies within the power of photography, and the vision of changing consciousness was my guiding force in creating this work. It's easy to romanticize revolution. It's harder to live in its aftermath. In 1999, I packed a small backpack with a few essentials, 100 rolls of Tri-X 400 speed film and 3200 speed film, one old Leica M4P, two lenses, and some clothes. I rolled all the $100 bills I had saved into a belt, into a little compartment in my belt that fit on my jeans, and I headed to Cuba, the island nation just 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Little did I know that when I started this project, it would become a decade-long personal project sponsored by the Blue Earth Alliance and is now being published as a book with Steidl. I was motivated by the belief in the power of photography to affect social change. The U.S. embargo against, Cu with, against Cuba was on my radar for quite some time before I even went there. As being unjust, I was determined to discover the real Cuba, beyond the cliché of old cars, peeling paint, and sexy color. There were moments of feeling stuck creatively, with sometimes a shift or a contradiction in my point of view. It took perseverance to continue on. Becoming great friends with Cuban photographers and Cuban people allowed me to enter into people's lives on a personal level. It allowed me to get in a little bit closer than I would have otherwise. Little gear, little bit of camera gear, not a lot, made me unassuming and non-threatening. It enabled me to be let in closer and trusted by people. I often stayed with families in a room I'd rent out. While shooting on location in Cuba, I kept a personal journal, which helped formulate my point of view and keep track of where my mind was. My journal entries are now included in my book to help tell the story of what I was thinking throughout the years I experienced in Cuba. There's some slight shifts that I acknowledge and grapple with throughout my writings. And as a photographer, and as photographers, we are always processing information through our eyes and through our intuition. Our brains sometimes take a little bit longer to catch up to what we're innately feeling and sensing through our eyes. In 1999, I wrote, once you have decided which road to take, you have complete freedom, one camera, one lens. As photographers, we never know the effect of our work for many years. I chose to shoot this project in black and white so that I could focus on finding the essence of the, cu of the culture in quiet moments. 
the emotions unimpaired by the appeal of color. The human form captivates me. The Cuban people are graceful, and that attracted me visually, both to the country over and over again, but also to the people and into their lives. It was during this trip that I discovered the two most important aspects of photography for me that would have a profound impact on the way in which I work. One was to have a point of view, to be thinking with your brain and to, to understand how you feel about a subject before you even embark. A lot of the work that I do before I even enter into an on-location shoot is um, by researching, by thinking, by reading as much as I can. And the second is to get in close, the power of the wide-angle lens. The ingenuity and resourcefulness and spirit of the Cuban people caught my attention. In 2000, I wrote, I have returned to the forbidden land, like a child drawn to that which is kept at arm's length. I find myself addicted to Cuba, the mystery, the essence, the sense of revolution, the beauty, and the pain. I passed a slit in the wall where a man sat selling refrescos. His name was Rene, and he spoke perfect English. I sat and talked with him for a while. I'll never forget how he put his hand to his nose and said, the people are drowning, the water's up to here, and we're tired. And it was in that moment where hearing his words was contradicting my point of view slightly because I had, I had come to Cuba initially finding, to try and find the beauty that sort of surpassed the stereotypes I had heard about Cuba. And, and we, were, we were in the midst of sort of this um, de facto embargo at the time in America where little information about Cuba was really coming to us besides sort of that surface level. It was a time where in the shadows of doorways, people would say their truth about their experience. And it was through listening, a lot of listening, that I started to gain a deeper perspective on the country. Cuba is an intoxicating and perplexing country. I fell deeply in love with the people, particularly their spirit of perseverance and their ingenuity when confronting profound adversity. It was ultimately within the shadows that I found Cuba's dichotomies in all their beautiful and trying complexities. As a woman traveling alone, unencumbered by lots of gear, I was able to fit in under the radar. It was in 1999 when I first went to Cuba, as I said, and it was at that time when Russia had just recently pulled out their support of Cuba financially, which they had been giving for 40 years, so four decades of financial support um, was, was completely pulled out, and then there was a special period where people were devastatingly poor and without uh, really any resources at all. Um, people were literally starving. And it was just after that special period, starting in 99, when people were coming out of this very dark time. And um, my generation in particular, when I went to Cuba in 99, I was, I was in my mid-20s, and my, um, my peers there had experienced the special period, and they were able to communicate to me what it meant to come out of it, and it gave me a deeper perspective and kind of altered my point of view um, as I listened to sort of what that period meant for them in their lives. In one of my journal entries, I wrote, people wait in Cuba. They wait for the bus. They wait for the bank tellers who count pesos slowly. They wait in line for ice cream, pizza, their food ration, or to buy bread. They wait in line for milk and soya. They wait and they wait and they wait. The streets are crowded with lines of people waiting, waiting for something or just to pass the time. It was these journal entries and my mind that was sort of 
taking in what I would see on the streets and then sort of apply that point of view to then my quiet work inside of people's homes where people would let me into the reality of their lives and it allowed me to see things in a different way. So this sort of element of Fidel Castro, which oftentimes in the media was the focus, for me it was the background noise because my experience, my point of view about Cuba was Fidel was in the background, always in the background, whether it was walking down the street you'd hear his voice sort of echoing the streets coming off of the radio or from someone's television set. Um, when you walked into someone's house, he would be on a, one of three channels and his voice would sort of uh, be part of the environment. And so my work was starting to reflect that, his, his presence in and amongst the life that would happen around him, like a father figure, like a watchman. He was there as a, as a major presence in their life. It was coming in off the streets and focusing on the quiet life, the, the quiet moments of, of all the, these different various elements to the society that really helped me sort of get in deeper and understand the culture from an insider's perspective. The street life in Cuba, as we've seen many times through the media, is quite energetic and beautiful and colorful and sexy and very enticing. And so it took a lot to, to enter into sort of the underground of, of the community and the culture in Cuba. But being there, being in that underground, was what allowed me to get closer and understand the culture and really fall in love with it. The beauty of the people, their ingenuity, um, their spirit, it all just was inspirational for me. I was drawn to quiet moments of people waiting, waiting for a change. I saw this literal and metaphorical waiting play out dramatically in the government-sponsored maternity centers throughout the island. The maternity centers were what would become a microcosm to me of Cuba as a whole, a nation in waiting, a country expecting the birth of a new era, a country on the brink of change. There's this sense of the unknown mixed with a feeling of hope. The island nation has the lowest infant mortality rate in the world, largely from these government-run maternity centers that take care of women at risk of losing their babies for health reasons. They're the first to receive food and medical attention. It's very rare to be able to be let into a government-sponsored facility such as a maternity center without permission, government permission. But being a young woman at the time with one camera, one lens, um, and just talking straight up with the people and saying, I'm here, I passed by and I happen to see these beautiful pregnant women and I'm so curious what this place is and um, can I come in and see it? And, you know, just explaining sort of where I was coming from, my, what my camera was all about, that I was there to try and capture the beauty of Cuba and um, bring back sort of pictures of real life that, that we wouldn't normally get to see in the United States. And when I would explain that, people were really quite welcoming to me. Um, I found being really honest and open with people about what my point of view was and where I was coming from allowed them to open up um, to me. And that, that was a symbiotic relationship with photography that I had with, with this subject. One of my Cuban friends invited me to her home in a small village called Amarillo, a few hours from Havana. We hitchhiked, 
rode on the backs of trucks and any other vehicles that happened to pass us, including I think it was a bus that was towing half a truck, and we rode in the half a truck that was being towed. There are not many uh, vehicles on the road, so you take what you can get. I was actually surprised that we got any rides at all. I thought we were going to be walking for miles because you can be on the highway and not see a single car for a long time. After my visit with my friend's family, I took off solo to reach the other side of the 780 mile long island. It was while hitchhiking across the country, I discovered the Cuban countryside and the sustainable farming practices they use mostly out of necessity, not choice. When Russia pulled out from supporting Cuba, they left um, farmers in a real lurch because they had been supplying all of the chemicals used to, to grow and fertilizers as well. And so farmers had to start to be resilient and rely on very old farming techniques of sustainability. At the time when I made these images, farmers were the only ones allowed to own land and could choose to either own their farms or were offered farming support like tractors and diesel and infrastructure if they chose to farm collectively and not own their land. The Cuban use of animal husbandry and the respect and love for their animals was inspiring to witness, especially compared with the brutal industrialized farming practices of the United States. As time passed, I felt that the country was different. Each time I returned on each successive trip, it would take me longer and I'd have to work harder to go off the beaten path and find the depth I was looking for and to keep on track with shooting from my point of view. There's always a surface readily available for tourists to photograph on a quick trip, a mere facade concealing many complex layers beneath. With sincere friendships, curiosity, and openness, one can penetrate the surface and see something deeper. In 2003, I wrote in my journal, I find this trip to Cuba to be particularly difficult it's a difficult time in recent political history. Black Spring, it's called. I arrived just as 75 Cuban journalists and dissidents were being imprisoned, and two planes and a ferry boat were hijacked within Cuba by Cubans, insisting on leaving for Miami. It is a time of deep paranoia and suspicion. People are especially suspicious of a woman now traveling alone with a camera. I'm relying heavily on instinct, my ability to speak Spanish, and on friendships to take me beneath the surface of the culture. While I'm part of many moments that showed me the positive remnants of the Cuban revolution, I also feel that Cuba is changing. I see now every, ever more clearly how important it is to document and witness the elements of a society that will inevitably change in the upcoming years. As a photographer, we have this almost responsibility. We're a witness. We are bearing witness to history now that may or may not be here in the future. Through photographs, we get to capture a moment in time that may not be here. It doesn't have to be far away, as Natalie mentioned. It can be right here in our own backyards. Life is always evolving and changing. The Cuban farming community was so welcoming to me. Um, it was pretty amazing being there during the Black Spring, which is when all of those Cuban journalists were being imprisoned. I had flown in not knowing that happened. It wasn't world news. It was local news for Cuba, and it, it had not reached yet the United States, so I ha had heard nothing of it. And the farmers almost, um, they welcomed me and they also helped me to understand politically what was going on. 
um, as they understood it. People would take me aside and they would let me know that it wasn't safe anymore for me to wander around with my camera as I once did. I was so moved by the farmers. There were so many different variations. They're, they're the farmers that were able to own their own land, they chose to. And then there were farmers who had chosen the collective, as I mentioned, the collective option from the government, and they'd get support. This is a group of collective farming women who had started to farm together and created this amazing um, tight-knit community of women farmers. The farmers, to me, almost became part of the land. This farmer with his veins, almost like the veins of the tobacco he's growing, they become one. It's almost like the, what the farmer was planting on the earth sort of became a symbiotic relationship. And I became really inspired by this idea of sustainability and sustainable farming. Now that US diplomatic relations have opened up with Cuba and the country is constantly changing towards an unknown future, images from today will later be testimony for a life that once was. Looking beyond the surface, it was always in the shadows that I became most confused about what it, to think and how to feel. My discoveries were not all positive but I ultimately came away feeling profound respect and inspiration for the creativity, gracefulness, ingenuity, and resilience of the, of the Cuban people, despite all they had endured. It's this point of view that ultimately guided my image making. Thank you so much. It's been great to be here.